All right, how is everybody this morning? I want to welcome y'all to uh, Wood Lake Addiction Recovery's 12-step education. Uh, what we're going to do today in this session, we're going to do two 45-minute sessions. We're going to go about 45 minutes or so. First session, we're going to take us a little break and we'll wrap it up with another little 45-minute or so session. Uh, if you're joining us remotely, you're, you're tuning in from somewhere else, what we ask is that on your computer you mute your mic. Because if you do not mute your mic, it sort of messes up our recording. So what we ask you is to be considerate enough if you're going to join us to mute your mic. Okay? All right. So saying that, we're going to go ahead and we're going to get started. Now, last session we were finished up with step 12. We're going to start the process over again in this session with step one. Now, just a couple of things before we sort of get into step one. If you've been uh, listening and you've been following along in the sessions, what you know is there's three things that we're going to try to get across to you in this process. And those three things are the three pieces to the puzzle that you got to have to put the puzzle of your life back together again. And those three pieces to the puzzle are problem, solution, plan of action. Now, everything that I'm going to do in this program is going to hinge on those three pieces to the puzzle. The first thing that problem, the solving any problem, basic problem solving, is you got to know the problem, you got to know the solution to the problem, and then you got to have a plan of action you can take that will get you out of the problem into the solution. Now, I don't care what the problem is, it can be uh, alcoholism, drug addiction, plumbing, finances, uh, automotive repair. You have to, uh, to know those three things in order to solve any problem. And basic problem solving, again, is problem, solution, plan of action. Now, what we're going to cover today in, in, in this session is step one, the problem. And step one is actually a problem statement. Now, before we get into step one, just some things that, that I think are very important for you if, if you're going to do this, okay? Now, one, one of the most important things that, that I think a lot of people miss, okay, is this book right here. It's called The Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, okay? I think one of the biggest, biggest mistakes people make when it comes to the book, okay, is the book is a textbook. It's become the basic text. Now, a text, a textbook, it's meant to be studied, not read. And I think what happens, a lot of people, uh, they turn to the back of the book, start reading some of these stories back in the back, and they start reading it like it's a novel. And so when they actually start getting into the front of the book where the, where the precise clear-cut directions are, uh, they, they try to read it like a novel instead of studying it like a textbook. Now, the first 103 pages of the big book, the first 103 pages, what they give me are precise, clear-cut directions on how to take the 12 steps. Now, after page 103, up to page 164, between 103 and starting on one, uh, to 164, they have some chapters in there to the employers, to the wives, a vision for you. See, these are all the whole scheme of recovery, page 160 up to 164. But the directions for the steps, the precise, clear cut directions, end on page 103. Now, the stories in the back, okay? 
they so serve a useful purpose. Uh, back back when the book was first written, okay, when this thing was very new and it was in an in, in its infancy, they didn't have a lot of meetings to go to. See, we're we're very very fortunate today. We can go to a meeting in just about any city that we follow up on. But when this thing first started, there were three particular cities. There was New York City, Cleveland, and Akron, Ohio. And that was the bulk of the meetings. So you take somebody down here and say, uh, cut off Louisiana. They couldn't just pick up and go to a meeting because there wasn't it. So what they did when they did the book, they put the instructions on how to take the steps in the front of the book. And in the back of the book, they, they in the back of the book, they, they put stories. See, they put meetings in print. That's what the stories were originally put in for. So somebody who didn't couldn't get to a meeting, they could go in the back and read some stories, and they had meetings in print. Now, today, it's not the case. We have meetings everywhere. We have meetings in just about every city that you can follow up, up on. So one of the biggest mistakes that I see newcomers make is they take the book, especially the first 103 pages of it, and try to read it like a novel. And if you try to read it like a novel, it'll go whoop, right over your head. The first 103 pages are a textbook on how to take the steps. And textbooks are meant to be studied, not read. Now, one of the I think one of the greatest things that helped me early on when it came to the big book, if you turn to the table of contents, okay, the, the table of contents in the beginning of the book, okay, if you turn there, okay, we're going to try to help you decipher how the book is laid out, okay? Now, if you take the big book, from the forward to the first edition, down to forward to the fourth edition. I mean, from the preface to forward to the fourth edition. All of that is the history of Alcoholics Anonymous. Tells you how a lot of this got started, some basic stuff about, about Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, if you take the doctor's opinion and Bill's story, these two chapters cover step one, the problem. If you take, there is a solution, more on alcoholism and we agnostics. These chapters right here cover step two. Three chapters for step two. Now, if you take how it works, that's steps three and four into action, is steps five through 11 and uh, working with others is step 12. So that's how the book's laid out. History, doctor's opinion and Bill's story, step one. There is a solution more on alcoholism and we agnostic, step two. How it works, three and four into action, five through 11 and one whole chapter is devoted entirely to step 12, working with others. So that's how the book is laid out. And it's sort of important that you know that. Now, the doctor's opinion and Bill's story. If you look at step one, okay, step one, step one is actually broken down into two parts. The first part of step one, okay, the first 50% deals with being powerless. And the second 50% deals with your life being unmanageable. And if you take all of step one, you take step one 100%. Now, step one is the only step we all have to take the same. And it has to be taken 100%. The first part of step one, being powerless. And the second part of step one, your life will become unmanageable. You have to take both parts of step one to take it 100%. Now, steps two through 12, you sort of have to do those to the best 
And I said the best, not the okay or less than, but the best of your God-given ability. And if you do that, you're going to be pretty damn good. Now, step one, okay? We're going to talk about the first part of the first step. Now, I, I want you to turn your big book. I want you to turn your big book to page 59, okay? On page 59... It says, step one, we admit it. Admit it to who? The judge, your wife, your kids? No, to your innermost self. We admit it we were powerless over alcohol, slash. And that slash breaks step one up into two parts. So the first part deals with being powerless. The second part says, that our lives have become unmanageable. So step one is broken up into two parts. First part covers the powerlessness. Second part covers the unmanageability. Now, I can remember walking in to, a, to, to the treatment center I went to, 12-step based, big book based, and they asked me some questions early on. And one of the questions or, or two of them, the first one they asked me was, I power us over alcohol. Now, I said, yes, that I was. And then they asked me, well, why are you powerless? The first question, are you powerless? I said, yes. And the second question was, okay, if you are, why are you? And I went, I don't fucking know, <laughs> which was the truth. See, a lot of people think when they come into treatment, they're supposed to say, I'm powerless over alcohol. You can, you could say whatever you want to say. It doesn't make it true or un it, what, what you have to do is be armed with some facts about yourself. Now, what, what they did, they armed me with some facts and they told me some things and that's what we're gonna talk on today. They told me about this obsession of the mind that I had that ensured I'd keep putting the first one in. And I had this allergy of the body. Every time I put the first one in, the allergy would cut me to smithereens. So when I was armed with some facts, really understood some things, that's when I actually said, you know what? I'm powerless over alcohol. And they said, okay, why? I said, because I have this obsession of the mind and I have, it's coupled with an allergy of the body that renders me power. Now, I could get a parakeet up here and teach it how to say mental obsession, physical allergy, powers. Does it mean that that parakeet's powers because it can repeat some information? No, you have to take this information, these facts, it has to go in here, and you really have to take the first part of step one here saying, you know what, that's me. I have this obsession, I can't quit using no matter what I do say, because every time I quit, I start again. And the reason I start again is because of the obsession. And every time I put the first one in, I set this allergy off, it produces a physical craving and I'm off to the races. Now, what we're gonna try to talk about the first session is the obsession and the allergy. Now, the second part of step one, they asked me, is your life unmanageable? Now, see how funny this shit is. I'm sitting in a treatment center no kids, no family, been in and out of jail, I'm homeless, and I got to think about whether my life's unmanageable. Now tell me that ain't some unmanageable shit right there in itself. I said, well, yeah, I think it is unmanageable. And they said, well, do you know why your life's unmanageable? I said, yeah, because I smoke crack and I drink whiskey. And they went, no, no, that's not why your life's unmanageable. I said, well, then why is it? They say, because you the fucker that manages your life. That's why it's unmanageable. And you know, I really started to think about that. 
You know, before I ever had drugs and alcohol in my body, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, guess who was managing my life? I was. Now, when I was first born, I had two powers greater than me managing my life. Most people have two, some have one. They call them mommies and daddies. Now, some of us might have had a grandma, an aunt, just a mother, just a father, a grandma and a grandfather, but we all had one or two powers managing our lives. Now, up till I was probably six, seven or eight, things went pretty damn good for me. The reason why? Because I wasn't managing it. Now, somewhere around seven, eight, nine, I discovered self. I discovered I could do what the hell I wanted to do. And most of the time when I did what I wanted to do, I figured out just don't get caught. Now, what started to happen when I started to manage it, things really started to get off track and become unmanageable. So around 11, 12, somebody comes up to me and says, hey, if you put this shit in you, it'll change the way you feel. Well, guess what I wanted to change? The way I felt. So I put that shit in me, and when I did, it was on. It was like taking a cup of gas and throwing it on a fire. Shit really exploded. So the way I sort of look at unmanageability is like this. Before I even introduced drugs and alcohol into my body, it's like I had a little campfire burning. A little fire called unmanageability. Then I start to discover drugs and alcohol, and it was like taking a cup of gas and throwing it on that fire. Shit really exploded and became very unmanageable. Now, if I just take the, the, the accelerant off, the drugs and the alcohol, which I did numerous times, guess what I still had burning? A little campfire called unmanageability. See, a lot of us think the reason our lives have become unmanageable is because of the using. I promise you, anybody who has to put something in them to change the way they feel shit is very unmanageable before that, long before that. And when they put the drugs and alcohol in their system, shit really explodes. That's why if you just take the using out, you still got some unmanageable shit going on. Now, we're gonna talk about the first part of the first step. We're gonna talk about the powerlessness part, okay? Now, there's two things that are coming into play here. And part of this thing centers in the mind, that's the obsession, and part of it centers in the body, that's the allergy. Now, you have to be able to differentiate the mental aspect from the physical aspect. Now, an obsession, it's a thought or an idea that overrules everything. Now, when I would get irritable, restless, and discontented enough, the obsession would kick in and it would overrule what the judge said, the PO said, the ex-wife said, the employer said, hell, it even overruled what the fuck I said most of the time. And it would tell me, hey, put the first one in. See, the first one is an act of the mind. Now, what I learned and what I really started to piece together was every time I would put the first one in, which was an act of the mind, I would set this allergy off in my body and it would produce a physical craving. And I would want the second one. So I dumped the second one in and the craving would double, which made me put the third one in. And when I did the craving tripled, which made me put the fourth one in. Now the craving is quadruple. So the second, third, fourth, and so on is an act of the body, 
but what sets it all in motion, the obsession, the first one is an act of the mind. Now, this shit's too simple for something like this. If I never put the first one in, I never set the physical aspect off, the allergy will never get kicked off, the craving won't, and I'm gonna start to get some better results. Now, the problem is, I couldn't quit putting the first one in. And I would come up with all kinds of crazy ass fucking solutions. I would move, I would change friends, I would go from smoking crack to snorting powder. I would go from drinking whiskey to try and drink some natural light beer. I tried all kinds of shit. But I really didn't understand what was really going on. See, I didn't really understand this. And every time I moved, every time I changed friends, changed jobs, changed relationships, I bought the obsession with me. No matter where I went, who I was around, I could have been around Mother Teresa. I was going to find the first one. Mother Teresa would have been missing some of her wine. And every time I put the first one in, the obsession would leave for the moment, but it would come physical in. Set the allergy off, my body would start to crave it, and the Red, the red Army couldn't stop me. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to get into the big book, see? And we're going to talk about the physical aspect of this thing. Now, what you have to understand, okay? And it's real simple if you don't complicate the shit. Allergy is physical, obsession is mental. The obsession is what happens, which, which makes me put the first one in. And once I put the first one in, Comes physical then. I set the allergy off, it produces a physical craving. Craving is physical. Craving's not mental. Obsession mental, craving allergy is physical. And you gotta understand the difference between a physical craving and a mental obsession. Now, I can remember when I first came in and they were trying to explain the difference between craving and obsession. I said, well, wait a minute. The craving's mental. And they went, no, dumbass, that's not. It's physical. I went, no, it ain't. <laughs> you know, because those alcoholics, we got to argue shit. I said, well, I tell you what. I can remember not having nothing for a couple of days. And I would finally go, you know what? I'm going to get me some. And I'd be going down to the hood to buy me a rock. And I'd have to pull over to take a shit. I said, now tell me that ain't physical. He said, well, what happens is this. When you start going down to the hood and you start thinking about it and your palms start sweating, your heart starts going like that, you got to pull over and shit. It's not the drugs doing that because you ain't got none in you. It's called adrenaline. See, when I would go down there, my adrenaline would start. My palms would start sweating. My heart would start going like that. So I thought that was a physical craving. It wasn't. It was my body producing a lot of adrenaline that made me do that. Now, once I hit the first one, then the allergy started and I physically started to crave the second hit, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. But the first one is an act of the mind, the second, third, fourth, and so on, is an act of the body. So you got to understand the difference between an obsession mentally and a craving, allergy, physical. All right, we're going to get into the big book. We want you to turn your big book. If you have a fourth edition, <clears throat> which most of y'all do, it's going to be XXV and three I's. In the doctor's opinion, XXV and three I's. Well, you're going to know you're there. The first paragraph down is going to start out with we believe and so suggest. Now, if I were to tell you XXIV, most of y'all would already be there. XXV and 3I. Now, if you have a third edition or newer, 
It's going to be XXV and 2X. Fourth edition, which most of y'all have, XXV and 3X. Way you know you're there, it's going to start out with we believe and so suggested. Okay. XXV with 3X. We believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy. Now, let's talk about alcohol and let's talk about this allergy business. Now, how many of y'all say, well, I don't drink alcohol? No, you may not drink it, you just shoot it. You may not shoot it, you snort it. You may not snort it, you may smoke it. You may not smoke it, you may just eat the shit like Skittles. So whether you eating it, shooting it, snorting it, drinking it, alcohol comes in a lot of different forms. Now, a lot of us nowadays, y'all are using something called a solid form. They're called Oxy and Roxy. Some of y'all are using heroin. Don't get it confused just because you're not drinking it that you don't have this. Now, how many of y'all say, well, I don't drink. No, you don't drink because you can get your hands readily on what you really like, which is either heroin or Oxy's or Cocaine. Now, let's just say for shits and giggles, I dropped you off on a deserted island. And I said, look, I'm going to drop you off here. I'm going to be back in six months to get you. Here's a case of Taka Vodka and six months worth of food. Now, when I came back to get you in six months, quite naturally, all the food would be gone. Now, with every bottle, or that taco vodka be in the same case unopened? And the answer to that is probably not. Because when you started to get irritable, restless, and discontented enough, the obsession would kick in and tell you, hey, you need some relief. And you would open up that case of taco vodka, take a bottle out, pop the seal off, and once you drank the first one, which would taste like shit to you, and you would go, oh! It would set off the allergy. Physically, you'd start craving it, and you would drink the second drink, the third one, and the fourth one. And when I came back to get you, all the food and the booze would be gone. And your ass would probably be looking for some coconuts to drink for some relief. So back in the book. So the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class. So what they're telling you is normal people don't have the allergy, so they don't crave the second, third, or fourth. That's why a normal person can drink one, maybe two, and get some relief, and they good. Says so these allergic types. Now, how do you know you're an allergic type? It's very simple. Every time you put the first one in, the allergy produces the craving. The craving tells you you have the allergy, that you're the allergic type. Now, <clears throat> one of the things I ask people, I want you just to picture this. They got a table, and on this table, they have every drug known to mankind. And alcohol is a drug. It's actually the oldest known drug on the face of this earth. Now, let's say, for shits and giggles, you could go up to this table and pick your favorite one, and you could get as much as you could hold. Now, let's say you go up there, okay, and you picked up as much crack as you could hold, and you got two good hitters with some fresh burnt charbroil in them, two good lighters where you take the metal clip off and you've adjusted the flame up, flame up about like that, could you take one hit off that pile, put it in the refrigerator, go on about your business for a solid month, come back, take one more hit off the same pile, go on about your business for another month, and do that every month until the pile was gone? Or when you hit the first one, would you set off the allergy? Would it produce the craving? And would you be on a well-known spree? Now, 
Let's say your favorite thing is oxycot. Let's say you pick, you got two pockets full, like 50 in this pocket and 50 in this pocket. Could you do one today, walk around with 50 in this pocket, 49 in this pocket for a month? Second month, do one out of this pocket. Walk around for another month with 49 in this pocket and 49 in this pocket. Or once you ate the first one, would you set the allergy off? Would it produce the craving? And would you start eating, snorting, and shooting them some bitches like there was no more? So what you have to ask yourself, this is how you determine if you're an allergic type. Every time you put the first one in, you set off the allergy, it produces a craving physically, and you couldn't stop if you wanted to. All right, back in the book. It says these allergic types. Again, how you know you're an allergic type? The craving tells you you're the allergic type. These allergic types can never, and it does say never, it don't say after 28 days at Woodlake, you can use safely again. It says never. Now, to me, never means never. And the reason I can never use safely, and by the way, safely means doing one or two. I mean two. That's what safely means. And the reason I can never use safely is because I have the allergy. And I'll always have the allergy. That's why I can never use one or two. It says they can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. Liquid, powder, peel, rock, any form. Once having formed the habit, see, once this obsession really takes hold and I form this habit, listen to what it says. Once <clears throat> having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, mostly in themselves, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. How many of y'all come into a treatment centers? This allergy is ripping your ass to smithereens. You come in, you got more problems than a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest, and you say, I don't know if I need some help. Or how many of y'all come in and you say, I want some help, but I just want to help the way I think help should be administered. I don't know about you, but when I came into treatment, this kept ensuring I was going to put the first one in. And the allergy and the craving kept ensuring I was going to destroy myself in the process. Now, if you can't stay stopped because of the obsession, and once you start, you set the allergy off, it produces the craving, and you will end up on a well-known spree. If you put these two things together, you are one powerless-ass person. Now, let's keep reading. Damn book sucks, don't it? I want you to go down to the bottom of that same page where it says men and women. It says men and women use essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. Look, why do I drink whiskey that tastes like fucking gasoline? I don't drink it for the taste. I drink it for the effect. Why do you stick needles in your arm? See, you stick them in your arm for the effect. I've had jackasses tell me I'm addicted to the needle. I said, that's fucking bullshit. If that was true, just take a goddamn needle with nothing but water in it and keep shooting that son of a bitch. We use because of the effect. We don't use because of the taste or the needle or whatever that shit is. Now, I'll prove it to you. How many of y'all like the taste? Let's say it's 100 degrees outside. You just finished cutting grass and somebody says, hey, I got some cold, cold mountain spring water. You want some? Now, 
would you sit down and drink a whole case of that shit in one setting? Or would you take you about a glass full and you would be good because you're drinking that for the taste. Now, how many of y'all have ever sat down and drank a whole case of Budweiser? See, because I'm drinking that not for the taste, but for the effect. I use because of the effect. All right, back in the book. The sensation, that's the effect, is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, that means it's kicking your ass, they cannot after a time differentiate the true from the false. How many of y'all come in and y'all are so full of shit, it's pathetic? Because you can't differentiate the true from the false. And you've been operating on a bunch of falsehoods, a bunch of lies for so long, you actually believe your own bullshit. And when somebody tells you the truth, you think they're so full of shit, you're the only one that knows what the hell's going on. I don't know about you, but when I got to treatment, I'm sure people who really cared about me and knew me went, thank God he's not around us anymore. I actually thought my people called the treatment center and asked if they could keep me longer. <laughs> we run around and we can't differentiate the truth from the false and normal people who can see the truth, they look at us and go, what the hell is wrong with you? And you go, nothing, nothing. What's wrong with you? How many of us, when we come into treatment, We've got to a point, we don't know what the truth is anymore. We don't know what the falsehoods are anymore. Look, I don't know about you, but I ran around with a bunch of, bunch of abnormal ass people for years. And abnormal became normal to me. And I would look at normal people and think they were abnormal. See, I couldn't differentiate the truth from the false. Now, after being away from it for a, a, a month, two months, three months, I can remember the first five or six months I was sober, I would go, oh my God, I can't believe I thought that was okay. Because I was starting to be able to differentiate truth from my bullshit. Back in the book. To them, see, to you, I've been told the estimates are 7 billion to 10 billion people on the face of this earth. And when I came into treatment, I was the only one on the face of the earth who thought what I was doing was okay. Everybody else said, man, what the fuck are you doing? See, it says to them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. I'm glad people didn't do what the hell I did. It says they are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience that sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few hits. Hits which they see others take with impunity. See, those others don't have the allergy like I did. After they have succumbed, see, after the obsession kicks in and I succumb to it, as so many do, I reach over and I put the first one in. And this is what happened. The phenomenon of craving develops. They pass through the well-known stages of a spree. And when I come up for air after a couple of days, I sing the Alcoholics National Anthem. I will never do that shit again. And it says this is repeated over and over and over and over. And I did that for about 26 years over and over and over and over. Unless this person, see, one with the obsession and the allergy, can experience an entire psychic change. See? 
up here in the mine, there's very little hope for her recovery. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to take us a little break. We're going to take us about 10 minutes today. Okay, 10 minutes means 10, not 12. So rush outside, go pee pee and go to the little potty, smoke you a couple, two or three cigarettes and come on back in, okay? It's, it's about a quarter till. We're gonna start back at five minutes till. And we're gonna put some of this together for you. The irritable, restless, discontent, we're gonna show you a few things, okay? 10 minutes.
All right, we're going to pick back up uh, half the break. We're going to finish up this session. The first session, we, we talked to you about the physical allergy. We talked to you about the mental obsession. Now, there's an easy way you can sort of tell if you have the physical allergy. The way you can tell if you have the allergy is every time you put the first one in, that allergy produces a physical craving. So the craving tells you you have an allergy. Now, the easiest thing to remedy an allergy is never put the first one in. Now, we know because of this, the mental part, that you can't quit putting the first one in. Now, in the big book, they tell me the main problem for the alcoholic centers in the mind rather than the body. Because if I didn't have the obsession, I would never put the first one in and the allergy would become <clears throat> a mute point. Now, <clears throat> for the last 19 years, I hadn't found it necessary to put the first one in. And the reason I hadn't put the first one in is because I don't have the obsession to use anymore. It's been removed. And where I have recovered is in the mind. I still have the allergy, have it till the day I die. But as long as I can recover here, I'll never put the first one in and if I never dump the first one in, the allergy actually becomes a mute point. Now, we read in the big book that the alcoholic becomes irritable, restless, and discontent. And unless they can experience the sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Now, we're going to talk about this part, the mental part, and we're going to talk about the physical part. Now, every human being who's ever been put on the face of this earth has something called a complex emotional barometer. Every human being that put on this earth has that. And that emotional barometer centers between this ear and this ear. Now, over here, this physical part, we're going to take somebody who has the allergy. We're going to put them here. And we're going to put on those average normal people here. This is one of them normal people who don't have the allergy. Now, you take a normal person. They start to get a little emotional buildup. They start to get irritable from work, from bills. And they say, well, I need some relief. So they reach over and they put the first one in them. Now, because they don't have the allergy, when they put the first one in them, they get some relief. This thing goes back down. They may, may or may not put a second one in, but they get all they want. They don't want any more because they don't have the allergy. Now, you take this person over here, me, who has this physical allergy. When my barometer starts going up and up and up, and I need some relief, my mind says, put one in, put the first one in, just like the normal person. And when I do put the first one in, I get some relief, just like the normal person. And that's where we quit being the same. Because when I put the first one in, I got the allergy. It sets off the craving. I end up on a well-known spree. 
And when I come up for air, this is what I say. I will never do that shit again. So what I do is I try to live in my own skin. So sober, I start to get irritable again. I start to get restless again. I start to get discontented again. I start to have a lot of fear from the shit I did over here. A bunch of resentments. So what happens is I start another buildup. And it builds up and it builds up and the mind says, hey, I know how you can get this some bitch back down. Put one in. Put the first one back in. This goes back down when I set that surface back off. So that's why the alcoholic, when the, when the barometer goes up, their only relief is to put one in. Now, I want you to really, really stay with me right here. Now, today, Okay. Does my emotional barometer still go up? Do I still get some irritability, some restlessness, some discontentment? I do. I'm a human being. But today, I sort of got a new obsession that overrules everything. See, my old obsession, when this would build up, was to put the first one in. Today, it's like I have a new obsession. When my emotional barometer builds up today, this is what it tells me to do. 10, 11, and 12. And when I do 10, 11, and 12, guess what happens to my emotional barometer? It goes back down, just like the first one used to do. But you know what 10, 11, and 12 don't set off? The allergy, the craving, the sprees. So what you could basically say is, okay, my old solution, putting the first one in, that quit working a long time ago, I have a new solution. The emotional barometer continues to go up from time to time. And when it does, 10, 11, and 12 is my new solution. Does the same thing the first one used to do. This thing comes back down. I get some ease and comfort. And I don't set off that surface. Now, let's just say someone is sober but they haven't taken the steps. See, they don't have this new solution. They haven't got to this point because they won't take any steps. They just sober. Now, I want you to turn your big book to page 55. Now, on page 55, I'll tell you what, I, 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 Page, page 52. On page 52 in the middle of the page, it says we had to ask ourselves why we shouldn't apply, look up here, to our human problems. The same readiness to change our point of view. Now, let's say you come out of treatment and you're not doing any step work, you're just going to meet. You won't, you won't get into the book. You won't take any steps. You won't do anything except go to meetings. Now, this is what is going to start to happen to you, okay? It says you're going to start to have trouble with personal relationships. Look up here. So guess what starts to go up? You're not going to be able to control your emotional nature. You're going to become a prey to misery and depression. You're not going to be able to make a living. 
You're going to have a feeling of uselessness. You're going to be full of fear. You're going to be unhappy. So all these things are going to start building up again. Now, since you don't have a new solution, you still got the old obsession, which is going to tell you, man, you need some relief, which at this point you probably do. And it's going to tell you to put the first one back in. Now, the unmanageability doesn't center over here. The unmanageability centers in my mind. So, what I have to try to do is keep this emotional barometer sort of in check. And the way I do that is with 10, 11, and 12. And where I recover, where I have recovered, is in the mind, not the body. But if I can keep this emotional barometer sort of in check, and it doesn't get way up here and go off, guess what I want to put in me? See, in the way that I keep the emotional barometer in check, 10, 11, and 12. You know, this shit is so simple. If you really pay attention and listen, if you just stay sober and you don't have another solution to deal with the emotional barometer, this thing's going to go up and up and up and off. And when it goes off, people better watch out because you're going to be on another tear, another little well-known spree. And when you come up for air, you're going to go, how in the fuck did I ever get started again? Now, the obsession. That's the tricky part of this thing. And that's what a lot of people underestimate. And that's what a lot of people really don't understand. See, because the obsession will trick your ass. And it'll tell you while you're in treatment, yeah, you don't need to do them steps like them other suckers. These meetings seem to be work pretty damn good for me. I'm really, I'm, I'm really not bad off as them. That's what the obsession will tell you. Okay? And after about a month or two of just going to meetings, the obsession goes, shit, I got this motherfucker right where I want him. And it'll start to tell you, hey, man, you've been making too big a deal out of this. I think you can do one or two now. So you reach over and you put one or two in and you go, well, shit, that experiment went so well. Let me do another one or two. Because the physical part's got your ass now. And you back off to the races. And when you come off air and everybody finds out, family, wife, kids, PO, judge, shit starts to hit the fan, this thing really goes up. And now you really need some more relief. So where I'm going to recover, where I have recovered, is in the mind. I have a new solution, or as you could say if you want, a new obsession. Because look, when my barometer goes up, the new obsession kicks in and overrules everything and tells me, hey, 10, 11, and 12. Now, for the last 19 years and some months, this is where all the work's been done over here emotionally. And I hadn't found it necessary to put the first one in. See, they talk a lot in this program in the big book about emotional sobriety. Physical sobriety is fucking easy. If all you want to do is be physically sober, go punch a police officer right here in the middle of his damn face. And I promise you for about 24 to maybe 64 months, your glass is going to be physically sober. What we're talking about, what the steps give me is emotional sobriety. And if I can get some real good emotional sobriety, the physical sobriety, it's a piece of cake. Now, 
let's talk about the obsession a little bit more. Since obviously that's the crux of the problem. Now, the mental obsession. An obsession is a thought or an idea that overrules everything. Now, I ask people this question. I want you to think of the one thing that is nearest and dearest to you. Most of the time, it's a child, a mother, a spouse, uh, a grandma, an auntie, a brother, a sister, a car, <laughs> a dog, your freedom. But think about the one thing that is nearest and dearest to you. And I want you to think about it for just a second. How many of y'all will run out in front of a car to save your child? If a car was coming, would you run in front of the car to keep it from hitting your child, your mother, your brother, your best friend, your grandma? And I got to tell you, most of us would go, I, I would, I would jump in front of that car. When the obsession kicks in, does it overrule your child, your mother, your spouse, your freedom, your grandma, your aunt, your car, your dog? It overrules everything. That's how powerful the obsession is. And that's how much people underestimate it. Now, how does a person like me form an obsession to use? If you listen, to, if you actually listen to this part, it'll answer a lot of questions for you. This thing I have between my ears is called a brain. And obviously, God gave me a brain to use, not to abuse. Now, what the brain does better than anything else, it's, a, it's actually a marvelous mechanism. My brain records success, and it stores it up here. And I'll give you an example. When you were a small child, physically, and you were learning to tie your shoe, how many of y'all did a lot of hitting and missing? Now, did this thing record all those hits and misses? Or the very first time you tied your shoe, bam! Did this thing record success? I'll answer that for you. It didn't record those hits and misses. It recorded that success. Because every time after that you got ready to tie your shoe, you did not record, re retrieve those hits and misses. You retrieved that success. Now. If they ever come out with a new way to tie your shoe and, and you were to learn the new way, the new, new way to tie your shoe would come in here, your mind would record it, and it would push the old one out. And every time you got ready to tie your shoe after you learned the new way, you wouldn't retrieve the old way, you would retrieve the new way. Now, when I was... 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. And I'm starting to manage my own life. I'm starting to get irritable, restless, discontent. And somebody says, hey, Kevin, if you put this in you, it'll change the way you feel. So I put that shit in me. And boy, did it change the way I felt. So guess what my mind recorded? Success. I said, fuck, I done found what I'm looking for. Now, as the years go on, the first couple, three, four, five years, the consequences are very minor. They ain't even worth even thinking about not using because I'm getting such good relief from it. Now, fast forward 10 years, 15 years, 20 years later, the consequences are really piling up. But I'm not recording those hits and misses. I still got that success recorded. Put the first one in. Now, I don't care what kind of consequence you face. If you still have that old success recorded up here, the first one, 
it's going to push all those consequences out and you're going to continue to put the first one in. Now, what's happened to me, what's happened to 3 million other recovered alcoholics, we've put some new success up here. Now, when I started taking the steps and finally got to 10, 11, and 12, it's like I found a new way to tie my shoe. In 10, 11, and 12, the new success came in and it pushed the old success, the first one, out. So today, when I get irritable, restless, and discontented, this new success says 10, 11, and 12. And I do it and I get relief. And as long as I'm doing that, that old salute success is gonna stay way out there. Now, if I quit doing 10, 11, and 12, and I get irritable, restless, discontent, stay that way long enough, the old solution, the first one, is gonna start coming back and pushing the new one out. And if I stay that way long enough, the, new, the old obsession or old success is gonna go, boom, come back, and I'm gonna put the first one back in, I'm gonna be off to the races. If you were listening to what I just said, this is what you probably should have been saying. Motherfucker. That explains it. Look, we don't recover physically. We don't recover from the allergy. Once alcoholic, always alcoholic. Where I recover is in the mind. So again, you could pretty much say I have a new obsession or some new success today and it's called 10, 11, and 12. Now, when my new obsession kicks in, it overrules everything. Just like the drugs used to do. But what 10, 11, and 12 does not do is set off the physical aspect of this thing, the allergy, and the allergy doesn't produce a craving. I don't end up on sprees anymore. And shit has gotten pretty damn good for me. Now, how many of y'all, you say, you know, I, I, I know I need some help. Fuck, you been needing help. Do you want some help? Do you want to change? You can't need this. You got to want it. Look, I needed drugs a lot, but until I really wanted the shit, I wouldn't go get it. You gotta want this. And look, what puts people like me in a position to want this, I'm tired of getting my ass handed to me on these sprees. I'm tired of the consequences. I don't want no more of that shit. And I want to do something different. I want to do something new. Most of y'all, you're selling yourself short. You won't give this a chance because it's going to make you feel a little uncomfortable. And we don't want little baby Bootsy to feel uncomfortable, now do we? Look, I'm gonna tell you like this, I do not, I do not sugarcoat this yet. If you do this, if you do what the first 103 pages of the book say, and you recover in the mind, you're gonna do some shit you don't wanna do. But if you continue as you are, if you continue to use, you really gonna do some shit you don't wanna do. So whether I do the deal, or I stay using, I'm gonna do some things I don't wanna do. I just have to figure out which results do I want from doing what I don't wanna do. Cause look, I gotta tell you, the results I get now from doing what I don't wanna do, like showing some jackasses, some love, patience, and tolerance, <laughs> the results that I'm getting now, hands down, would blow my old ones away. So to sum up this session, if I have an obsession of the mind, it's going to ensure that I keep putting 
the first one in. So the obsession is going to make sure I continue to put the first one in, and the physical allergy is going to ensure I destroy myself in the process. So to sum up step one, if I can't stay stopped because of the obsession, and once I start, I can't control how much I'm going to use because of the allergy, if I combine them two things together, I'm one powerless ass person. Now, next session, we're going to get into the solution. Now, the solution is only as good as your understanding of the problem. See, if you really don't understand the crux of the problem and what happens to me over here, you probably won't want the solution like you got to have. What you're going to say is, yeah, I need some help, mother, but I really don't want to do what they want me to do. It won't work. I'm telling you now, it will not work. You have to be all in or you're actually all out. So next session, we're going to get into the solution and y'all have a good day. Thank y'all.